Hey guys, good to see you all. Hope you had a good week and everyone in Texas survived the ice storm. It's so good to see everyone. Uh, if you are new on this call, I see a couple new faces. We try to keep it just to 30 minutes. Um, we've had special guests on presenting the last two Sundays, but tonight we're just going to have the coaches presenting on topics. We do want you to ask questions as they come up. And so if it pertains to the topic, do so in the chat. And then at the end, if there's a topic you want to have us cover outside of something we haven't covered yet, uh, maybe it, as it pertains to your development right now, something you're seeing in training and you have a question, like this is your opportunity. This is the way... Uh, we want to do it because we can knock out not only your questions, but that for other athletes that might not know what to ask and how they can then learn from and develop in their training. So one big thing we wanted to start with was just the importance of zone two training. It's kind of one of those things where it's not sexy. Uh, a lot of people really uh, want to push the limits and think that it's more speed and intensity that's going to hit their help them hit their goals. I even actually, funnily enough, had some messages this week as I was training and sharing my progression back to fitness. And uh, they were, I had people asking, how are you going to get fitter? Is it going to be like harder workouts and multiple workouts? I'm like, no, like right now, I'm really just focusing on, on building my endurance back. Um, and so we want to touch on the very much importance of that. And without, without a good base, without the endurance in zone two work, zone four, zone five, zone three is, is not possible. So Harold's going to touch on the scientific side of it, and then we'll weigh in. Ready, Harold? You're on mute. There we go. Okay, there I am. Can you guys hear me now? Yeah. Okay, so as Natasha was saying, zone two, the stuff that's not uh, too sexy, it's the boring stuff, right? It's the stuff that we need to do that people aren't, don't get too excited about, right? It's just the clocking in and doing the work. What I like to often call just chopping wood and carrying water, right? The unsexy stuff. Most of your training should be in this zone because you're an endurance athlete, right? And if you know the nomenclature or, or, or how we describe the zone two, it's typically called endurance or it's called steady zone two. Sometimes you'll hear it called aerobic or moderate. These are terms that we often hear or see referring to zone two. Essentially zone two is just about 60 to 70% of your max, okay? So the boring zone, right? The zone where you're out for a run and you can hold a conversation, okay? Uh, and just like Natasha said, I'm dealing with the same thing with a lot of my athletes. As a matter of fact, I had a conversation with one of my athletes this morning after we got finished running. We did a 10-mile zone two boring run. Um, and at the end, he was a little nervous and was starting to get a little bit anxious because he's going to be racing Ironman Texas. And he's wanting to know when we're going to increase, when we're, things are going to get harder. I'm, I'm ready to do more. I'm ready to work out harder. And, uh, you know, a lot of what we do as coaches in this sport is we're pulling back the reins on people, trying to get them to... Not get too excited too early. It's a long year, right? And zone two endurance training has a lot of benefit that I think a lot of people kind of take for granted, right? Because uh, they want to do the sexy workouts. They want to floor themselves in a session, wake up the next day, feel fatigued, feel tired, feel like they did something. Um, but trust me, when you're doing a lot of your training in zone two, you are reaping the benefits. They're just mild benefits consistently put together over time that builds a big benefit, okay? So, and that's one of the reasons why we do a lot of zone two training because it is repeatable, all right? We're doing those high intensity, sexy workouts. They're often not repeatable. They should only be done few and far between to spark some fitness and show a test to see what you can do. But those sessions are not repeatable and we have to train a lot. We need sessions that are repeatable that we can do that don't create too much fatigue so we can do it again the next day. This is zone two training. Okay, um, that's where we're going to get most of our volume. Uh, I do want to, I'm going to type in the, in the comments over here. I'm going to give you guys two names of two people that you can look up on YouTube or you can start following them. There are uh, 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 exercise scientists who are specialists in this field or in zone two training. One of them is Peter Atea. He actually lives here in Austin. He has a podcast. He's on um, uh, YouTube. Uh, and the other guy is Steven Seiler. Also has ties in Austin. He did his postdoc at UT. I'm going to type both of their names in over here, and then you guys can uh, look them up afterwards if you want to dive a little bit deeper into the science of things, okay? But the way I like to look at zone two um, is, is through a line of questioning, right? So I'll ask my athletes, and I have several of them, several of you who are on this zone call, this is probably going to, you're probably going to relate to this pretty easily. Um, but when you go out to do a training session, 
your heart rate goes up right away, right? Or even when you're running easy, your heart rate gets a little bit higher than you want it to be, okay? So let's say that you're out running a 10 minute pace, which for most people is a fairly easy pace, right? You should have a very low, you should be able to do that while putting out very little output, meaning your heart rate should be very low. If you're going out at a 10 minute pace and you're doing a run and your heart rate shoots up to 140 or 150 and stays there, then that should tell you something, right? You're, you're, you're missing part of the metabolic window, okay? The metabolic window should be big, right? We have a lot of science that's recently come out on heart rate variability. HRV is something that we're seeing that's very important. And for those people who are not very good or don't do a lot of zone training, will typically have lower HRV, okay? Which means that when they do work, the heart rate shoots up really high and it stays up there. Whether they're doing a 10 minute pace run or whether they're doing an eight minute pace run, you don't see a lot of variability. There's not a lot of difference. As a coach, I wanna see a lot of variability in those two run paces. I wanna see a distinction between your heart rate, several beats per minute difference between a 10 minute pace and an eight minute pace. And that's just an example. Uh, for you, that may be an eight minute pace and a six minute pace. It may be a 12 minute pace and a 10 minute pace. I'm just showing a little bit of variance, right? So one of the ways that I like to um, approach this with my clients is through the idea of raising the ceiling by lowering the floor, okay? If you lower the floor, then you're creating a bigger metabolic window from which to do work, right? And if you and I are both all variables controlled, we're running a 10 minute pace next to each other, my heart rate's 110, your heart rate's 140, who's at the advantage? The person with the lower heart rate, right? If you're running the same pace, all of the variables controlled, that means that that person's got a bigger window to do work, okay? And can sustain a higher intensity over a longer duration of time, essentially how that works, right? But if you don't have that low end ability to do work, your metabolic window is smaller than your toast, okay? A couple of other things that we wanna think about is that when you have, when you can, when you do a lot of zone two training, you create that low end metabolic window, you're gonna be, Better at using uh, fat utilization for, for energy, for ATP production. You're going to be able to um, uh, recover faster from your sessions. You're also going to have a small bump in mitochondrial density, right? You work more slow twitch muscle fiber, which is going to be key for endurance athletes because our events are so long. We need that less fatigable muscle fiber to be very robust. You have to train it by doing that. If you're going out on your runs and you're just always running fast, you're going to bypass a lot of that um, physiological adaptation. You're going to be really good at going to the high end, but um, that high end gets exhausted really quickly. And then what are you going to do later in races, right? When the person who's really good at working the low end is going to have that high end availability late in a race, the other person is using a higher zone earlier heart rate wise. Uh, when they get late in races, they're already going to fatigue that, um, that energy system so that they're not going to be able to pull on those resources as well, right? So a lot of zone two training is just being able to allocate resources for later in the session, okay? To conserve energy for when it gets really hard, if that makes sense, right? Um, so here's what happens. Everybody, just like my client this morning, you get to the spring part of the year, and we're all there right now, and you've done some training. Maybe you've done a couple of running races. You're starting to get a little bump in your fitness, and you start to get a little bit anxious, a little bit antsy, and you wanna press down on that gas, on that gas pedal, and really start hitting a lot more intensity because you feel like you're ready. And all of us do it, I'm guilty of it. I'm sure Natasha's been guilty of it before as well. But the smart thing is to hold back a little bit, be a little more patient, especially early in the year. If you're looking at your race schedule, maybe you have races in August, September, October, later in the year, if you're doing too much high intensity this early, by the time you get to October, you're gonna be smoked, right? But we wanna develop that low end metabolic window, right? We wanna lower the floor so that we have more room to do work. As we get to the higher intensities, we'll be able to hold those um, intensities for longer durations, okay? So try to be a little more patient. Think, okay, these workouts are boring, but most of your training should be fairly boring anyways with little small amounts of spicy, sexy stuff mixed in there. Um, and, and just hold back, especially early in the year. And if your coach has given you a lot of zone two, you can, you can, you can increase, um, you can increase volume and duration at zone two and get a fitness bump there, right? Just do more of the boring stuff. 
Um, but you also have to consider that, that over time, as you do this, you're taking one step forward every single day. When you're doing the high intensity stuff, it's a lot of taking two steps forward, one step back, because you are increasing the fatigue factor. And now we need more recovery. So if you're one of those people who just needs to feel like you're always doing hard sessions, then what happens is you kind of get into a negative feedback loop, right? Because you want the intensity in your training so that you feel like you've done some work. Then the next day you need recovery from it, but you don't like training in zone two. So we want to do something spicy again. You're just getting yourself put further and further into a hole. Uh, and eventually, I mean, you can, depending on uh, how strong you are, how many years you've been doing this, you can go on in that direction for quite a while before something really goes wrong. But when it does, now you're setting yourself back for the remainder of the year, potentially, um, by burning yourself a little bit early. So continue with the consistency of doing sessions, repeatable day after day after day, where the, 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 the recovery, necessity of recovery is minimal. And you're just going to keep taking a step forward. You're putting, you know, brick after brick after brick. That's how you really build a foundation. Um, so resist the urge to really want to start doing a lot of spicy stuff early in the year. Talk with your coach about these things. Um, I'm talking with a lot of my athletes about it as well. Uh, just trying to pull back the reins and be a little more patient, especially for those who have races later in the year or for those who don't have that heart rate variability at the low end. A lot of zone two training is going to be um, is going to be necessary for you if you want to have a lot of success in this sport. Um, I think uh, that's really, I mean, without getting hardcore into a lot of the, of the science of it, uh, I think that's a pretty good, uh, you know, general explanation of it. If anybody has any questions or anything about that, let's go ahead and discuss it now. So I'm going to quickly add, um, and I spoke about this in a podcast, uh, you can get very far uh, with your fitness with no addition to high end work. Um, Mark Allen is actually famous for this. You know, he really was doing this Maffetone method. And uh, he, when he started doing his Maffetone training, he had never actually slowed down enough to really work on that foundational training. And if, correct me if I'm wrong, but he did like a three mile aerobic run test and it was like an eight, 830 pace. And he just kept on doing aerobic miles. And what you see over time, he was able to train a lot more, but over time, and even each week, you can see small little changes, like maybe that 830 pace is now 825 pace, 820 pace. He was able to get it all the way down to sub six until he saw that he was no longer making gains from purely aerobic training. Then he added the work. And so am I correct in saying that, Harold? Yeah. 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 So yeah. Um, I know for myself, when I was coming back from having Nadine, I didn't want to add any intensity too soon. And so I just did a whole bunch of aerobic miles. And my process was actually to do it on the treadmill. Um, it was because it was controlled. I would start if you're someone that has a really hard time controlling their heart rate, getting going, which I know there are a lot of you that do. Um, you start on the treadmill and I would literally start at like four miles per hour, real, barely moving. And slowly I would say, okay, my heart rate's under control. I slowly added, added, added until I got right underneath like my max aerobic heart rate and I'd stay there. And it was a fun test for me. Like I loved zone two work. It was a fun test for me to see each time I did it, if I could maybe go 0.1 faster and see how long I could hold it and then see what the decoupling would be, which is the decoupling is, is over time your heart rate is going to go up if you haven't really built the aerobic conditioning um, as then your pace needs to, and your pace essentially drops, right? So if you're trying to keep your heart rate at 140, for example, and you're running at a 10 minute mile and then slowly over time, because the aerobic conditioning is not there, or maybe you're not drinking. So know that it's affected by heat and hydration, your heart rate goes up and now you got to drop the pace to keep it aerobic. And so it's kind of a fun test to kind of play with yourself. How can I keep that even throughout the run? Um, but anyway, I found treadmill really helps because when you're out on the, the road running and you're kind of creating your pace, it's actually very easy for that heart rate just to shoot up immediately versus starting very, very easy. And from that, I learned that when I did run outside and I did want to control my heart rate, I needed to start very, very, very easy. If my average pace was a nine minute pace for aerobic runs. I would literally start at like a 10, 10, 30 and slowly work my way up to it. And then I could hold that faster pace for longer at that lower heart rate. So um, anything you want to add that's, to that? That's, yeah, I do want to add to that. That is a perfect strategy because what happens is, is people who don't have that low end metabolic availability to do work, you go out on a run and your heart rate shoots up pretty high right from the beginning, right? Uh, even when you're running slower paces. And when that happens, 
the kinetics of the heart and the way our cardiovascular system works, it, once it shoots up like that, it, it's going to be very hard to be able to bring it back down. So starting way conservative at a lower heart rate and then slowly letting it drift up to where you want it to be is a much better tactic. Otherwise, if you're going hard on those numbers and you start running and your heart rate shoots up real high, you're going to be walking to try to bring it down. Um, and for most people, a lot of people, what will happen is it just won't even come down to the number that you want to see. So start much more conservative and let it and, and let it come up. Um, quickly, I do want to uh, comment on 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 the on the text that was right here with somebody uh, Conrad. It looks like is making a, a reference to the Norwegian guys. Okay, so a couple of things here. One is I'm just going to give you a piece of advice right now. What you see from them on social media and what they say in interviews and what what's going on uh, is the sexy part of the training, right? They're trying to create a or a picture of what things look like. And I promise you behind the scenes, it's not that cool or flashy, okay? So when you're watching them and you're seeing all that's going, going on, you have to absorb that content with a little bit of a skeptical eye, okay? They're not showing you the boring stuff that they're doing. They're only showing you the sexy stuff at 10,000 feet of altitude, doing 400 meter repeats in the snow on the track at max effort, okay? All that other other boring stuff that they do 80% of the time, they're not showing you that, okay? I promise you they are doing a lot of zone two training. The only difference is that their zone two training is pretty spicy compared to our zone two training, right? So their running paces are much faster than ours at that output, okay? They've been doing this for a long time. I promise you, uh, if they only did you know, a lot of intensity all the time, then they would be hurt every other year. Um, they wouldn't have reached the pinnacle of where they've reached. All of that is built on the backbone of years and years and years of just riding your bike at 115 beats per minute for five, six hours at a time. Okay. That's the foundation. And then when they go do the sexy stuff, they film that, they put that on Instagram, all you guys in triathlon, all eat it up and it's great. Right. Uh, but I promise you they're doing a lot of that zone two training, a lot of it because they're just doing a lot of training period. And they wouldn't be able to do a lot of training. Uh, if they were doing that training that's not repeatable, that requires that creates a bigger fatigue quotient, right? So you need more recovery from those types of sessions. And when they go do those altitude training that they do in Switzerland at, you know, and it's a frozen tundra up there and they're running fast on the, tr on the track, there's periods of time where they're coming back down to, to not sea level maybe, but coming back down to lower elevations and doing some aerobic training and then going back and forth uh, throughout the year, depends on what timing, uh, where they are in their and their meso cycle, four year cycle for, for Olympics is what those guys are really looking at. Then the macro cycle is year to year. And then the micro cycle is probably per block of training, two weeks, three weeks at a time. Uh, but they're going back and forth and they're doing training at altitude with some intensity. They're going down, they're doing a lot of zone two true training at lower altitudes. And I promise you, it's not always that sexy. Um, but yeah, so when you're watching and you're, you're consuming that content from those guys, be a little bit skeptical of what you what you're seeing because it's they're they're trying to you know they're trying to persuade a brand or an image, right? Uh, behind the scenes, they're doing a lot of that boring stuff. Trust me. Yeah. Harold, uh, let me let me add to real quick. You you mentioned Peter Atia and dropped that name in the chat, and I went ahead and dropped in probably two of the the deepest dives he does on Zone Two is with uh, Indigo San Milan who's really big in this field too with, with zone two training. And so they talk a lot about the, the, how, to, how they do it, why they do it. But Indigo is the coach of Tati Pogacar. And so he obviously won the tour de France. Um, so if you want to hear from somebody who talks about how much zone two training they're doing, he dives into it in that, in one of those two podcasts, uh, he talks a little bit about like what Tati is doing in terms of the amount of zone two training versus the amount of not zone two training and it's mind blowing when you when yeah. you hear how much zone two training they're doing versus not yeah i mean if you if you can't run for several hours at a very low heart rate then you just don't have the foundation to be that good in this sport i'm sure you know gustav eden and, and christian blumenfeld could go run 20 miles at a nine minute pace and their heart rate may not even go over 110 you know what i mean so that's a lot of chemical work, mechanical work that you're putting on the body over that type of volume or duration of one session um, without necessity of a lot of recovery. You know, it's, it's just two steps forward and no steps back. But that's the boring stuff that you don't see a lot of, right? They want to show you those paces of where they're running, you know, uh, you know, four 
30 miles or whatever, you know, whatever it is, you, you guys follow all that stuff. So, you know, you know, all that stuff as well, but yeah, it's, it's, it's zone two. If, if, if you're ever in a place where you're just trying to figure out what you're, what you need to do with your training, because you either don't feel great or you do feel good, or you got a race coming or whatever, you can always default to doing a lot of zone two training and you will get a benefit from it. I promise you. Yeah, I agree. That's funny. I listened to a podcast with Inigo yesterday on um, trainer. It's the training peaks podcast. And he explained it that all the zone two work gives oxygen to the other workouts. And without doing zone two, you have no oxygen to perform zone four, zone five, like all the sexy stuff. And, you know, we always talk about also, um, that is the supporter of work that allows you to hit these sessions really hard and then recover off them. And, uh, just within this team, we have such a wide range of volumes that uh, people are uh, doing. And you guys need to know that the guys that are pushing the 20 plus hours, they're just adding zone two. They're not doing like harder workouts that you guys, uh, harder workouts, more frequent workouts than you guys are doing. It's just, they have more time. And so where you guys are doing an hour zone two ride, well, they have more time to do a two hour zone two ride. Um, and with that, it allows them to just, again, build that really great foundation within to hit these, these big workouts that we're doing. Yeah. Um, there's one more, did you want to add something? There was one more thing I was going to add, but I can't remember. Um, you and I were talking the other day about the minimum effective dose, right? Joe Friel coined this term uh, in the very first triathletes training Bible, which is like the Bible for triathlon coaches. It was the one of the first texts that was written on the subject of triathlon coaching, which is a fairly new sport. Um, and he termed this, you know, this idea of minimum effective dose because of the absurd amounts of volumes that we do in our training. And zone two is that minimum effective dose. Right. That's the that's the lowest zone that you can do work in where you're going to get physiological adaptation from. Um, and it's repeatable. Right. So think of if you're thinking about that, like minimum effective dose just makes a lot of sense to me, because, you know, if you're if you're if you're getting the same exact stimulus from running a, a, a 930 pace as you do from running a nine minute pace, why not run 930s? You're getting the same adaptation. Right. So, and that's just an example. I'm just throwing out some, you know, a, a, an analogy there. You guys kind of get the idea, right? Um, and zone two is that minimum effective dose where you're going to get the increases in blood volume, increases in mitochondria density. You're going to get um, better, better fat oxidation for energy mechanics. You're going to get all these different things that you're going to, you're going to uh, uh, achieve from doing that type of training. So it's just boring. And, and you, people start to get a little bit antsy after they have been doing too much or doing a lot of it over time. So, uh, so yeah, be patient, stay in that zone too. do a lot of training there. Yeah. I'm going to speak to three things quickly. Um, one is we had the question come up hills. What happens at hills? And if my heart rate goes up, well, Steven Saller actually has a famous Ted talk that's actually on our website where he actually, it was this wake up call for him that he was out skiing and he was seeing an Olympic gold medal skier out there. And she took her time and actually went from jogging to walking up a hill because to that day she had to do zone two. And that's, I think where a lot of this, his studies were spurred from that exact moment where, wow, this Olympic skier gold medalist is walking up a hill. So yes, until you can actually run up a hill where you keep your heart rate in your aerobic training zone, you should be walking up it. Um, so that's number one. Number two, we often get the question, hey, I'm training at 60 to 70% of FTP, for example, or I typically run at this pace, but today my heart rate is higher what should I do uh, especially when we program the bike workouts I think it's more applicable there so just say you're doing 60 percent of FTP and you're riding and now your heart rate today is actually 10 beats higher than it normally is should you back off the power and the answer is yes now we go to the minimum effective dose to keep your heart rate under control and then take that as a sign that you're not recovering, you might be getting sick. Um, you should know exactly what, like if you're riding at 60% FTP, exactly what that correlating heart rate is. Um, and then be able to make decisions and be your own coach through the workouts. On the flip side, we're also seeing people that are very quick responders. And so they're doing this work, doing this work. And before we get a chance to really even up their FTP, they're, they're, they're actually increased their, you know, all their zone levels and now they're riding at just say 160 watts and they, where they were riding at 130 heart rate it slowly progressed down or 
uh, gone down over time and now they're riding at 110 heart rate. Well, now we're in zone one. We're not even in zone two anymore, even achieving a minimum effective dose. Should you, during that workout, increase your power to get you back to zone two? And the answer is yes. So really pay attention to it. Um, and then the final thing I'm going to tell you that I really enjoy doing is breathing. I love to be on a treadmill or during these workouts and bike workouts where you're taking these really deep, deep like diaphragm breaths and seeing what it does to your heart rate. And you will find your heart rate if you get control of it. And even by good form, good breathing, good form, your heart rate comes down. And now, hey, I can run faster. I can actually bike further just because of paying attention to these little things versus zoning out and, and watching a film while you do it. So, okay. Does coaches, anyone want to add to that? Okay. I'll just, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to add one quick thing. So the other thing to remember with your heart rate is the fact that there are things outside of training and you mentioned recovery and rest, but also alcohol. So if you drink alcohol the night before, you should expect your heart rate is going to be higher the next morning. If you listen to music while you run and have trouble controlling your heart rate, that's something to avoid. And also caffeine as any stimulant will do, will also increase your heart rate. So as you're really trying to train and get faster at a lower heart rate, which is the goal of all of us with zone two training, really pay attention to those things that are outside factors. And so if you're you know, drinking two cups of coffee and then going for your morning run, you don't understand why you can't keep your heart rate down, maybe wait and save your coffee till after the run and see if it has a, a positive effect for you. Perfect. I am going to add two more to that. Um, number one, thank you, Nick. That was awesome. Um, number one is if you're in a group, you talking, your heart rate's going to go up. So if you are actually trying to keep up with someone uh, that can stay in that aerobic zone, ask them open-ended questions and have them talk and you keep quiet in order to keep your heart rate down and now they can run with you. So I actually do that all the time, number one. Number two, you know, people make fun of us because we're always carrying our handheld water bottle. But as the temperatures start rising, hydration plays effects uh, in your heart rate. And so if you're wanting to run faster at a lower heart rate, you have to drink. And for me, anything over 30 minutes, I take my handheld water bottle with me. I've got electrolytes in it because me drinking and the action of doing so every mile, it actually keeps my heart rate down for lower versus me going out and running for 45, 60 without anything. So those two, those two additions. Okay. Okay. Uh, coaches, anyone else want to add something? Um, we were going to have Ashton present, but we're already out of time. So we're going to leave that for next week. We had uh, the endurance exchange, which is a triathlon um, seminar. We had different people coming in and presenting on topics from scientists to other coaches. And a bunch of our coaches actually got to go to that and learned a lot that we wanted to actually pass on to you guys. Um, and so Ashton was going to speak to that. And so you can look forward to that next week. Um, Jules, Ashton, myself, we were there and, and, and we'll cover some things. So, um, I think that's it guys. Um, I think one thing I'm going to say, I think we have a whole bunch of people doing Texas 70.3 and a workout that is coming up for some of you. And I want to touch on it is we're riding zone two, and then we're doing like a steady state climb up Alp de Zwift. And this was my thinking behind this. You do Galveston for the most part you're going out and you have a tailwind and you're coming back and you're going into a headwind and you are, it's time, your tension on the pedal stroke, there's no brakes in Galveston. It is constant and flat. And so muscular fatigue is usually what comes upon you at the end of Texas 70.3 into the headwind. And so us climbing just the steady state climb up Alp de Zwift kind of mimics that you turning your legs over, having this complete time under tension for like an hour, hour and a half straight um, is like you riding into that headwind coming back to Moody Gardens. Uh, and then you've got all that big zone two work done. And if you go over, you know, into zone three, zone four, it's not going to ruin all the zone two work you've done prior to that. So as you do that, picture yourself coming back into the headwind, knowing that that is exactly what it's going to feel like. So, okay. I think that's it. We are going to shut it down. Guys, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we hope you have a good week. Bye, guys. Coaches, if you can stay on for a second. I think we have something for you.